Well, this turnout for a Friday night is very impressive. Um, I hadn't planned to do so, but I think I might just say a couple of words about the one of the projects out of which some of this research is coming. Um, I'm working with a group of scientists and engineers on endocrine disrupting substances in food contact project products. And um, that has turned out to be really interesting from, from somebody who works in law and governance because these substances are very difficult to detect using standard um, methodology for detecting toxic uh, substances. And um, for, for various reasons, which I can say a few very, very superficial things about because I have no scientific background. So one of the, the challenges that my scientific colleagues are facing is to build confidence and trust around new testing methods that they're developing. So confidence and trust within the scientific community, uh, within, um, within government. So within government there are, of course, people who are, are very cognizant of uh, the production of scientific knowledge and others who know very little about that process. And then, because this is a, a very hot button issue, obviously, it's extremely important for them to be able to develop confidence in their in their approaches, in their methodologies with the, with the general public. Um, so my work with them is taking on a variety of different dimensions. Um, tonight what I want to talk about is um, based on research that I've been doing over the last um, maybe five to seven years, but uh, at this juncture I'm very much turning towards some new methodologies and some new scholarship. Um, embarking on some studies including uh, looking at private law regulation of risk as well as thinking about uh, approaches to regulation more generally. So uh, this talk is pretty much situated between those, those two uh, projects, the one that's more or less ongoing and the, the one that's really just starting up. Um, so the apologies for the rather vague nature of the title, I am terrible at titles. Um, so, environmental law between authority and legitimacy, about a week ago when I began to pull my uh, thoughts together for this paper, I realized that I hadn't mentioned science at all in the title. Um, I hope that it's at least implicit in the, in the notion of environmental law. Um, perhaps just begin with uh, a few comments about particular challenges that environmental law faces. Um, I have always been very interested in the way in which environment confronts law. Um, it's never very easy for law to figure out how to react to or how to address environmental degradation. And it's really fascinating to see the attempts to bring law to bear on environment. So that, I am of course very interested in environmental protection in and of itself, but um, in my scholarship, one of the things that's really fascinating me about environment is precisely these difficulties, these challenges. So I'm going to mention a few of them very, very briefly. Um, Obviously, one of the most important uh, involves difficulties of perception. It's very difficult for laypersons to detect environmental degradation. And when they can detect it, it's extraordinarily difficult for them, using their own insight and experience, to figure out where it's coming from because of long latency periods, because of the, the fact that environmental uh, causal linkages can flow over great distances of time and space. And so when, uh, when laypersons are trying to figure out uh, environmental degradation, they often have to, they can't rely on their own judgment. It's extraordinarily difficult for them to do so. They need very often to turn to, to expert insight. So uh, heavy reliance then on expertise, which is often very complex and subject to significant uncertainties. Um, even, even with input from experts, it, it remains extraordinarily difficult to figure out causal linkages, either retrospectively for the purposes of figuring out whose fault something is and who owes damages, and even more so, in fact, prospectively, when one wants to figure out how um, actors that are in the process of maybe generating risks ought to behave in order to minimize those risks or mitigate them or eliminate them altogether. So those are... Um, those, that's a series of challenges that uh, any attempt to govern environmental degradation have to face. Um, another challenge has to do with uh, a significant asymmetry between uh, legally protected interests, property, um, physical health, uh, certain economic interests on the one hand, and the nature of impacts of environmental degradation on the other hand. So there are, in, in other words, a lot of environmental impacts that fall outside the scope of legally protected interests. Um, 
There are, of course, various ways in which one can try to address this problem, which include um, thinking about ways to represent the interest that the environment has, independent of interest that, um, that other uh, more traditional legal persons have. Um, but very often the response to this particular problem has been to conclude, I think rather too quickly, that private law is, uh, runs into too many obstacles with respect to environmental protection and that we what we really need to focus on is uh, public law models. I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about that as I go along. Um, obviously, another huge problem for law or governance more generally with respect to environment is uncertainties. Um, now, the, the most prominent response of law to uncertainty is, of course, the precautionary principle. And I want to dispense with that rather quickly and then move on. Um, I think that precaution has done extraordinary work, it's done a good deal of heavy lifting, but I also think that it's time for us to, to close the book on precaution and think about, about other approaches. Precaution, I think, is based on a number of assumptions that are now I think pretty clearly revealed to be highly questionable. And they include the notion that uncertainty is exceptional and temporary when in fact it is structural, especially when we're thinking about environmental and other kinds of impacts. And also the notion that risk is something that you can choose to uh, engage in or opt out of. Um, it's very often the case that one can't even choose not to impose an environmental risk. And of course, one can never choose not to engage in risk. Risk is, is ubiquitous. So those are some challenges that are fairly generic. Anytime law or governance tries to confront environmental degradation, these are at least some of the things, some of the problems that, that are encountered. But in addition to that, we have, I think, some challenges that are perhaps more contemporary, either in that they are, um, these are phenomena that have been intensifying recently, or because these are phenomena that are increasingly well recognized and therefore need to be taken into account. And in some cases, it could be that they are, they are simply new. I think one of the most important ones is acceleration. So when one thinks about environmental regulation, time comes up again and again. Acceleration, I mean uh, in a couple of different ways. First of all, the notion of social acceleration. Um, the, the shrinking of the present, um, the greater and greater difficulty of relying on past wisdom, knowledge, experience in order to figure out what's going to happen in the future. Um, and this as a result of uh, just general social acceleration, the speeding up of, of uh, modern life, but also importantly, obviously, technological and scientific developments. Bound up in that, but distinct in some important ways, is of course the acceleration of environmental change. And for similar reasons, it becomes extraordinarily difficult for, for farmers, for hunters, for um, Aboriginal elders, for scientists, for governors, for, for any number of actors to figure out what is going to happen in the future based on what sorts of things have happened in the past. So um, the process of learning about environmental degradation is often frustrated by the simple fact that there is so very little time to gain insight into what has happened um, and to the extent that one can gain such insight, it's less and less applicable to what is going to happen, the, the processes that are currently unfolding. And that is partly due as well to the complexity of feedback loops. So you may be able to track certain phenomena and model them in a, in a particular direction, but the minute you begin to put those together with other, um, other more or less linear uh, causal phenomena, you see that there is no linearity anymore. The, the situation becomes highly complex. That obviously has all kinds of implications for, for governance. Um, another set of phenomena that, again, are not necessarily new, but that seem to be intensifying somewhat, uh, include a plural, uh, pluralization or plurality or fragmentation of authority. So um, we have, of course, the, the reproduction of a whole slew of governance structures at the international level to address various environmental phenomena and increasingly frustration with governmental and intergovernmental responses to environmental uh, governance, which have resulted in the emergence of um, a fairly robust and very complex and highly controversial set of transnational, often private authorities that are essentially taking matters into their own hands. And though they have no constitutional mandate going ahead and, um, uh, I would argue, legislating, um, essentially enacting series of norms in the public interest despite the fact that they're private actors. Um, 
Now, this is interesting for a number of reasons. In particular, it's a very heterogeneous landscape. These are not um, organizations or institutions or actors that are hierarchically structured in any way, that are nested in any way. Uh, very often, they don't communicate or coordinate with one another at all well. Um, in fact, they may be in open competition with one another. In addition to that, the phenomenon that I'm paying a little bit more attention to uh, lately is the multiplication of sites of theoretical authority, the sites uh, where scientific knowledge and scientific insights are being developed. So for a very long time, and still to this day, uh, states have been trying very hard to maintain a kind of a monopoly on the, the vetting of scientific information that comes to be used in the public sphere. So a kind of a division of labor that emerged, I guess, in the post-war period between scientific community on the one hand and government officials on the other, whereby the scientists were given an enormous amount of latitude as long as they could continue to produce innovations that could be useful to, uh, to governments in various ways, either through uh, uh, medical advances or industrial or um, aerospatial um, and obviously consumer products. Now this um, attempt at um, on the part of governments as acting at a kind of, as a kind of gatekeeper to valid and rigorous scientific knowledge is very much breaking down in all kinds of interesting ways. One of the last gasps, possibly, is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And um, I think that that organization has done some, some really incredible, groundbreaking work, and I have immense respect for a lot of the scientists and you know, the people who are involved in that project. But at the same time, I, I fear, and a lot of people fear, that it's essentially collapsing under its own weight, and that it simply hasn't been designed in a robust enough way to face up to the kinds of pressures and the kind of scrutiny that it has come under. Climate scientists, for example, were not prepared for their role as uh, highly controversial public intellectuals, for example. Um, so what we have emerging now is um, an enormous amount of difficulty around the question of what counts as valid, rigorous, or something like correct or true, much more controversial, scientific knowledge. Uh, but these attempts are still being made to figure out how to, uh, how to, how to set up these structures to, to vet certain kinds of scientific knowledge. This is going to become... Um, this continues to be enormously difficult, of course, the science wars in various manifestations have been raging for decades, and I don't think that they are going to calm down anytime soon. But what is happening now, and what has hap been happening over the last few decades, is that we have access to um, vast quantities of data on various kinds of environmental performance, and data that is more or less indirectly related to environmental performance. And a wide range of actors, many of which have um, nothing to do with state-based constitutions or governmental authority, have realized that they are capable of scraping this data, um, vetting it, so reaching conclusions about the quality of the data, analyzing it, and translating it or transducing it into vehicles or methodologies or some kind of format that can be taken up and used by governance authorities, but also by civil society organizations and to a greater and greater extent by uh, individuals. I guess some of the paradigmatic examples of these sorts of things would involve, would include um, uh, the certification, uh, including those that have been run by private organizations like the, uh, the Forest Stewardship Council or the Marine Stewardship Council. So highly user-friendly logos on products that are supposed to stand for, um, in some cases, social respons socially responsible, re responsibly produced goods, and in most cases, uh, sustainably sourced goods. Now, the fact that these, um, this crunching of an analysis of data and the production of uh, things like certification or standards or black and gray lists and so on and so forth are happening at multiple sites means that the process of figuring out what counts as um, high quality scientific inputs into governance processes is going to be happening at multiple at multiple sites as well. I think that the, the situation is at present pretty cacophonous and is likely to become more so. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think we're going through a very interesting period where um, we are having to develop different ways of appreciating what counts as scientific knowledge in general and what counts as 
good or high quality or reliable scientific knowledge more in particular, with a lot of disagreement not only about the standards but also about the way in which they're being applied. So with that um, backdrop, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the problem of authority and legitimacy in governance in general, and obviously focusing in on what I think is a particularly challenging context, namely environmental governance. So if we take as a, as a jumping off point um, a notion of uh, political authority as power that's exercised in virtue of and in compliance with law, we see this as an essentially circular approach because, of course, the law that authorizes political authority is uh, precisely the law that allows political authority to operate, including by way of adopting laws. So what we see in vast bodies of, of literature is attempts to step outside of the circularity and think about how we can analyze the question of political authority, which uh, very often includes uh, or segues into questions about how we can analyze the, the authority of law or the validity of law or simply the legitimacy of law. Um, now, one of my concerns uh, with a lot of these attempts is that the processes of legitimation, in particular processes of democratic legitimation, are being fairly seriously overtaxed in general, I think, but more in particular in contexts like environment where there is such heavy reliance on um, epistemic grounds of authority, so inputs of science, not only science but in importantly science. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time developing that argument, I'm just going to leave it to one side, but it's uh, part, I think, of the background of, of what I'm talking about and ends up motivating a lot of the, the research questions that I'm asking and the ways in which I'm, I'm answering them. Um, so what we, what we see happening is, um, in particular in, this, in the area of transnational law, uh, an enormous amount of activity around the development of legitimacy because of course these authorities by and large have to build their legitimacy from the ground up. Their authority is essentially self-constituted, self-declared, but in order to have any impact on the world they need to attract um, perceptions of legitimacy. And they do so in a wide variety of ways. There is an enormous amount of activity around democratic legitimacy, but there is also an enormous amount of activity around epistemic legitimation. So scientists play a very prominent role in, these, in many of these organizations, and the norms that they produce, often in the form of highly technical, very dense, and multi-layered standards, uh, are essentially the product of um, scientific... Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I was going to say essentially the product of scientific input. They are presented as though they are essentially the product of scientific input. But obviously there is an enormous amount of political decision making that's going on around these. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So um, the great fear, um, which is I think a very genuine fear, around environmental law generally, and I think around these transnational um, authorities in particular, is um, technocracy. So the density of the normativity, the heavy reliance on science, the difficulty for uh, civil society organizations, legally trained scholars, um, laypersons in general to, uh, to wrap their minds around this normativity is raising significant fears of technocracy. The response to that is generally, well, often, a call for the democratization of science. Um, this is based on some very cogent and, and significant observations, including the, um, the observation that there are social, institutional, as well as formal, logical components to the production of scientific knowledge. I think that this is impossible to avoid today. This is well understood. So scientists, we, we know, are making myriad judgments in the process of generating scientific knowledge, judgments about methodology, judgments about statistical uh, cutoff points for statistical relevance, judgments about when to determine that a conclusion can be reached. And of course, they're also making judgments about what counts as an interesting field of research, about what counts as an interesting problem, about what counts as an important or relevant question. Now, the fact that these judgments are being made in ways that are um, 
not at all dissimilar to the way that judgments are made in any other uh, relatively highly systematized um, field of knowledge production, um, is often understood, and I think um, with reason, to generate a point of connection between scientific knowledge and other kinds of knowledge, in particular between scientific knowledge and um, political insights or legal insights. Um, but I think that the translation of scientific judgment into something that, um, that looks like a political judgment or a legal judgment is actually an extraordinarily difficult process. Um, it's, it's very far from straightforward, partly in, as a result of the complexity of the kinds of judgments that are being made. But of course we can no longer treat scientific insights as a black box that can simply be inserted unproblematically into the process of um, creating policies or creating law. We're, we're well beyond that. So what I have observed uh, for quite some time and the puzzle that I continue to work on trying to come at it from different ways is that what I'm referring to is epistemic legitimation, which is heavily dependent on science, and democratic legitimation are very active and very important in governance agencies concerned with environment, whether they be transnational, government, uh, domestic, or international. But they tend to run in essentially parallel tracks. There tends to be very little interrelationship between the two of them. And so, um, perhaps uh, a, a worst case scenario, would involve a situation where decision making is essentially technocratic, but that there is a kind of a gloss that, uh, that I refer to as uh, participatory or democratic theater that draws our attention away from the essentially technocratic decisions that are being made. Now, let me be a little bit more explicit about what I mean by a technocratic decision. I don't mean a scientific decision, although a technocratic decision is heavily dependent on expert input. Um, scientific knowledge is not produced for the same reasons that, um, that legal rules or, or policies are produced. The, the logics of these different systems is sufficiently different that um, you can't simply pluck uh, a scientific insight from the realm of science and plunk it down into, into law or politics. So obviously what is happening in these technocratic decision-making processes is that an enormous amount of discretion, political discretion, is being exercised, often behind the scenes, often in ways that are completely untransparent and in ways that don't readily stand to be justified. But we often don't see this because there are so many public fora for uh, comment and criticism, so many, um, so many avenues for inputs from members of the public that the, tech the essentially technocratic nature of these decisions is, I think, um, far too often essentially hidden from view. So, in addition to all of this, um, under the best of circumstances, authority in these contexts is going to be exercised under really serious conditions of uncertainty. That is always the case, that's inevitably the case. Um, but there are some special ways in which it's true in the context of environment, especially under conditions of social acceleration and the acceleration of environmental change. So, on the one hand, uh, I think that means that something in, along the lines of democratic legitimation becomes all the more important because these decisions inevitably involve a high degree of arbitrariness. Um, I say inevitably because when you are facing uncertainty, uh, to not decide is also a decision. Uh, these decisions have to be made. One can't wait for all the data to be in it. It never will be in. Um, now, with respect to uncertainty, there, is, uh, there are various things that could potentially be done uh, on the part of a wide variety of actors not to, um, not to eliminate uncertainty. It's impossible. This uncertainty is structural and utterly inevitable. But to at least operate in, in, more, um, in more effective ways under, under conditions of uncertainty. Now, unfortunately, very often we see legal norms operating with uh, to create perverse incentives in a couple of different ways. Um, perverse incentives on the part uh, for firms to, uh, to pursue new methodologies, new technologies, um, new products, new substances, or new uses for old substances. Because whenever this kind of innovation happens, even if the driving force behind the innovation is in, to make the product uh, 
or the process more environmentally friendly, that innovation will attract regulatory scrutiny in a way that doing things the same old way one has always done it will not. So um, declining to take these kinds of economic risks to develop new products in new ways or new processes in new ways is actually um, actively and perversely discouraged by a lot of legal regimes. Um, and in addition, another perverse incentive that's operating is an incentive on uh, for firms to avoid generating information about the environmental risks that they create. Because if you, if a firm is operating under conditions of ignorance or huge uncertainty and a risk is manifested, then um, conclusions about the legal responsibility of that firm will be made in a certain way tend to be much more forgiving of the firm. But as soon as the firm uh, is known to have had in its possession information about the environmental risks that it's generated, uh, then um, very often, the, the result of legal normativity is that this firm will, will be deemed responsible. Now, obviously, this is, pervert, this is very problematic in that firms are, not, uh, in a, are often avoiding innovation and often avoiding um, the uncovery of information, precisely because the legal structures within which they're operating are encouraging them to behave in this way. So, um, to come back then to the, to the idea of uh, decision making under uncertainty, and here I'm flipping back to governance authorities, uh, whatever, whatever, uh, uh, whatever form they take. Um, democratic legitimation about, uh, with respect to decisions that are being made under conditions of uncertainty, I think needs to take a much more procedural register, it needs to operate in a more procedural register. Um, the idea behind that assertion is that if you don't know what the content of the decision should be because you're operating under conditions of uncertainty, it seems to make sense that um, you should at least be sure that the processes through which the decision is made are relatively robust. But in addition, um, this is a concern that I have more generally about uh, a kind of democratic legitimation that focuses on the substance of rules or bodies of rules one by one. Uh, this kind of democratic legitimation, I think, works best when we are in a social regulation mode, when we are thinking about um, a material goal that we want to achieve and essentially reverse engineering to then determine what kinds of legal obligations have to be imposed on various actors in order to bring about this goal. So in other words, a kind of um, governance in a planning register where we are trying to figure out, first of all, what uh, future present we want to bring about, what, what we want the present to look like in the future, and then simply figure out how to, how to get there. Now the problem with that planning approach in general, with respect to environment more in particular, is that we don't know the route to the desired endpoint until, um, until we've already gotten there. A lot of the information that we need to make decisions about how to accomplish a particular material goal is not available in the present and it, it can never be available in the present. And in fact, even once we, we implement a piece of legislation and we see how it's ended up working out, we, can often, we often fail to figure out why the results that we have observed have occurred. So it seems to me that in general, um, processes of democratic legitimation of political authorities and most emphatically processes of democratic legitimation of legal rules um, probably needs to be oriented more in a, in a procedural direction. So focusing on what kinds of authorities ought to be entitled to make what kinds of decisions and through what sorts of procedures. Now that's a very, very brief overview, but I'm very happy to expand a little bit on those ideas in, uh, in questions and answers. Now I referred a little while ago to this notion of participatory theater. Um, my concern that a lot of the uh, the democratic legitimation procedures that are growing up around environmental regimes of various kinds is not really, doesn't really enter into contact with the norms that are, that are promulgated, with the ways in which political authorities exercise that authority, and most emphatically not with the ways in which uh, things unfold once a particular law or policy or legal regime comes to be implemented. So I want to think a little bit about um, moving beyond that state of affairs and uh, 
I've been, I've been turning around this problem for quite some time, and any progress that I feel like I make is extraordinarily incremental, if that. But here's a, here are a few observations on that. So, I think that part of the problem lies with conceptions that are the, the kind of model or maquette that, um, that is built of scientific knowledge within legal or political systems. In short, the idea that law has of science the idea that law has of scientific knowledge and the ways in which scientific knowledge is produced, and in particular, the ends to which scientific knowledge can be put. These, uh, these models of scientific knowledge within the legal and the political systems are uh, inevitably superficial and don't correspond very closely to what actually happens within science. But this, um, this lack of correspondence is inevitable. The picture that law has of scientific knowledge is never going to be a one-on-one -on -one image. Nevertheless, I think that they, they need to be rendered much more sophisticated in some important ways. Exactly how, I, I don't know exactly. I have a few, a few ideas. So one of the observations that is made again and again in the literature is that it seems to be extremely important um, as much for politics and law on the one side as for science on the other for you know, to be a clear understanding of what science is and what it is not, what the boundary around science is and where it's located. There are some very good reasons for this, because if you know what science is, then arguably you ought to be able to know what good <coughs> science is and what bad science is. But uh, in the relatively recent past, and still very much today, the approach to this kind of question has been to approach science as a unique form of human knowledge. So that the boundary around science and not science has to do with um, the things that science as a form of human knowledge can do that other forms of human knowledge absolutely cannot. That, sci that the scientific method or the ways in which scientists go about asking and answering their questions has really essentially very little to do with um, what happens in, in social sciences, what happens in humanities. A completely different form of production of knowledge. Um, now under this conception, scientists are primarily responsible for boundary maintenance, for figuring out what or who is in and what or who is out. Now, as it happens, when, um, when we get insights into the uh, social institutional aspects of science, into the important ways in which scientists are making judgments, this makes uh, science very, this image of science as a kind of a citadel that is unique among forms of human knowledge becomes, it makes science extraordinarily vulnerable. So as soon as it, has, it comes to be understood that science is just like other forms of human knowledge, except that um, the questions that are answered are, are asked and answered are different, the methodologies are different, then all of a sudden this idea of science as being, um, as having the value that it has, uh, the reasoning behind that um, essentially fails. And so immediately we see the unleashing of uh, various manifestations of the science wars right away. Because if science isn't unique, as one has been told for decades, then it, if it is just like other forms of human knowledge, then it's just as fallible and just as problematic and just as uh, subject to criticism. So moving beyond that idea of science as this, as this kind of a citadel, we can certainly think about ways in which the quality of scientific judgments or scientific conclusions could be evaluated. And indeed, um, as I mentioned a, little, a moment ago, the idea that scientists are making judgments and not just proceeding in a formal logical way actually could make it easier to figure out how to, or at least at a superficial level, it seems that it ought to make it easier to figure out how science and politics, science and law uh, could interact. <coughs> So how do, we, how do we reach these evaluations about the quality of scientific judgments? Now, here I've been turning for quite some time around the work of William Regg, who, whom I first encountered as a translator of uh, Habermas's Between Facts and Norms and as a Habermas scholar more generally, but he has this sideline as a sociologist of, of science, and a very serious one at that. Um, now, he has been focusing on these, these points of judgment and the possible connections between scientific judgments on the one hand political judgments, legal judgments on the other. He doesn't talk about law that much, actually, but um, it's not that difficult to make, the, to make those connections. 
So he notes that although it will rarely be possible for a scientist to expose the full range of uh, justifications for decisions that she has made in the course of generating scientific knowledge, she, I mean, even within, within the scientific community, this can't be done. The full extent of one's um, uh, scientific experiment or conclusions can't necessarily be presented to scientists that are just a few sub-disciplinary boxes over. Nevertheless, there is a justificatory process that happens within scientific communities. It happens within labs, it happens within sub-disciplines, within disciplines. Uh, scientists are able to talk to one another about why it is that they did the things they did and to make convincing arguments about why their decisions should be trusted and their conclusions uh, treated with confidence. So similarly, um, such communicative structures can be built out from science into um, more into the public domain, into, uh, into politics and into law. And at these points, it becomes much easier to implicate certain kinds of stakeholders. So Reg has looked at a, a series of case studies, including the production of um, food guides, which is, I mean, there is so much politics around the production of food guides, as you are probably, as you are probably well aware or the production of guidelines on uh, nutrition and links to cancer, which is a matter of incredible uh, political machinations, lobbying, a lot of money is spent on these. He's also looked at the co uh, context um, in, um, in particle physics, in which decisions are being made about methodologies. He's looked at a, a wide range of case studies that have been, that have been, um, that have been conducted often by other uh, uh, sociologists or historians of science. And he goes about identifying these, these junctures where scientists have to explain what they're doing to, to somebody else. And he argues that these can, in some contexts, be institutionalized in certain ways. The, the, uh, the goal, or a goal, I suppose, is something like making it possible for people who are very far removed from the scientific domain to figure out under what circumstances they should have confidence in the knowledge that's being produced. And I think that that, in this context that I described a little, a little while ago, where these scientific conclusions are going to be produced by multiple sites, uh, many of these sites which are going to be producing as well, their own standards for the vetting of scientific knowledge. I think these, un these institutional understandings about what counts as a, a form of scientific knowledge or a form of scientific enterprise that's worthy of our confidence are going to be really important. So I will attempt to conclude by backing up a few steps and talking a little bit more about the, uh, the broader context in which I'm inserting, um, in, which I have in the back of my mind, I guess, as I go through this. So obviously, as I mentioned a couple of times, one of them is the entrenchment of transnational, often non-state forms of authority. And the fragility of that authority um, is very interesting because you can see uh, in real time the processes that these organizations are going through in order, to, in order to win their authority, in order to make good on their claims to authority. So a highly fragmented context in which there is a pluralism of epistemic but also um, political authority. Um, a wide range of different forms of interaction between these self-styled political authorities and the publics that they purport to, uh, in whose name they purport to act. Um, so we're very far from the paradigm of a polity that is organized around um, a territory uh, by virtue of a constitution that creates some kind of meaningful link or a link that is viewed as meaningful amongst those three things. So the, the political authority, the polity in whose name that the authority acts, and a territory on which that authority is exercised. Uh, very far away from that kind of uh, relatively comfortable context. So multiple sites of authority where there are, which are mutually contesting and are contested by a wide range of stakeholders and observers who so are constantly investing enormous amounts of energy and effort in shoring up their authority and shoring up their legitimacy in ways that, uh, that can sometimes make them extraordinarily fragile. Um, the decisions, the judgments, the, uh, the, 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 the legal standards that are promulgated by these various sites of political authority 
enter uh, a very cacophonic, um, heterogeneous environment where there is no, as I've already suggested, no hierarchical authority, no hierarchical structure. Um, and I guess I will end with a comment that um, about one of the ways in which I've been thinking about how these, this authority is to be exercised, thinking in terms of a kind of a network logic where there is no, no one observer standing in any one place can see what is happening within the rest of the, of the network. Uh, which obviously requires, um, amongst many other things, a degree of confidence in the things, the processes, the mechanisms that are happening elsewhere within these, these nested and interacting networks. Um, so uh, I think that one of the really important tasks of the kind of science that is carried out at the, at the boundary between science and regulation, so sort of, uh, toxicology would be a good example, um, is going to be figuring out new ways of, um, of making claims to epistemic authority and new ways of developing confidence and trust amongst the range of stakeholders that uh, these authorities need to speak to. So I'll leave it at that for the time being. Happy to hear your questions. I think I spent, uh, I, I can easily spend a couple of years reading reading one of his books and then I immediately have to start again. Yeah. So he raises very, poses a very similar question yes. where his answer to it is very different. I mean, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, but... Yeah, I, um, I think that my, I feel I'm on, I'm very much in agreement with, with Ladeau's approach in pretty much every respect. And the one that I'm looking at um, the most closely at the moment is, um, his arguments about alternatives to certain forms of democratic legitimation, which he argues, as I as I completely accept, are heavily overtaxed. He goes a step further than me and argues that, in any event, it isn't clear how these processes of democratic legitimation can can connect to validation at all. But that that step is a little bit obscure. So I've been focusing quite heavily on on that and trying to. To figure out how to articulate this argument, in particular to a group of uh, to groups of environmental scholars, which is very very tricky. But uh, why do you need democratic legitimacy for these decisions in, the, in this in this classical sense? Of the word, this is this is what it, either either we can just dispense with it altogether, or we can't manufacture it. We need to construct some sort of kind of equivalent to it. Yeah. So the direction that I'm moving, very much following uh, some of the moves that he's made relatively recently, is. Um, thinking about relocating the, the democratic processes in time in particular. So much earlier, much, much earlier, and much, much later. So one of the arguments that I, that, uh, I picked up on and tried to develop in this context is that if you wait for the moment where the legal norms are being developed, if you wait for the moment when the permit is being issued, when the decision about the, the pipeline is being made, it's far too late, but it's also far too early because um, even in, the, in a context where you have a government making a decision, and the, one ought to be fairly clear about who the stakeholders are, you're not. The stakeholders, the universe of stakeholders is, is only going to be revealed in the future. And that's emphatically the case with these non-governmental um, non authorities where they, they don't even really make a claim to be speaking in the name of a particular polity. They're, they're, rough equivalent of a polity is this very exploded series of actors, many of whom don't even know they're implicated in the network until all of a sudden they find that they're not able to get their products to market or you know, some, some impact has had. So he talks, for example, about um, ex ante, uh, problems with ex ante democratic uh, 
legitimation, unless, of course, you're talking about much, much, much earlier in, in, in a context in which people are uh, informing themselves, educating themselves, bringing themselves up to speed. And he refers um, to, to the work of John Dewey, for example, in this context. And then, you know, fast, fast forward to after any decision has been implemented, and then you begin to understand what the implications of the decision are. So um, one of the concerns I have with the, um, with the focus on the, the substance of rules one by one is that it completely goes past the, uh, the idea of the systematicity and the dynamism of law. So if you look at rules one by one, you can only do so if the rules are very transparent about what they do. And that's only the case in the context of social regula regulatory rules, which um, arguably are, this is arguably not something that law does at all well anyway. Um, so for example, the idea, which I've worked with um, in other contexts of um, figuring out how to protect the rights of people who realize after the fact that their interests have been affected. Um, so focusing on, um, uh, they could be adjudicatory me mechanisms or compensatory mechanisms or, um, or other forms of dispute resolution that don't kick in until much farther down the road when, when people actually can, can figure out how their interests are being implicated by these decisions. So yes, elsewhere I do follow, follow that work a lot more closely. Um, but I'm working up to it very, very cautiously because the audiences that I have often to work with are, are going to be highly skeptical. And I don't want people to stop listening before I've even started talking. Thank you very much. Thank you. In which direction do you think law should move when it comes to viewing science differently? Sorry, I forgot that we were supposed to collect a few questions, and that is a good opportunity for me to. Next question, please, and I'll just think about that. Thanks for the favor. I'm continuing on the, on the issue of, of democracy and what, what it means in these kind of processes. And I'm, I'm not sure if you're pointing towards uh, democracy as something which should point towards what the general interest is mm. in these particular instances, or as a process of legitimation of a particular decision through through numbers, as majoritarian politics. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, maybe one more, and then I'll venture an answer. Maybe to pick up Marianne's point, um, how do you see? when people try and apply some development in legal language to environmental issues, I think in particular um, there's been moves to get rivers to have human rights. Mm -hmm. so do you see something that's sort of interaction the other way that when people try and just sort of trendy versions of law into promoting scientific goals and how do you see that sort of interaction? Okay. Um, just it might make sense actually to work backwards because um, with respect to the, um, the moves, the human rights moves, some of the concerns I have about those approaches are that they simply take the politics and move them from one place and plunk them down in another. And I'm very concerned that the place that the politics ends up is not a good place for those discussions to be had. So um, I don't want to be too categorical about this, but I have certain fears and reservations about the human rights approach that um, you've got uh, a highly constrained form of logic and reasoning in, in legal argumentation. And it's constrained in those ways for reasons that um, can be justified. I mean, even if you don't end up accepting those justifications. Um, but those constraints I don't think operate at all well when you are essentially talking about, um, about the distribution of, of goods and bads, uh, winners and losers. Um, where I, I think that a uh, a political discussion needs to be had and the, the political nature of the discussion needs to be made much more obvious. Um, I also think that um, a lot of scholars who are working along those lines are actually very naive about the extent to which um, that is going to lead in a very technocratic direction. Because how are you going to know what the interest of the river is? Well, amongst others, you're going to be asking a lot of scientists. Scientists aren't the only people with input in, into this, but their voices are going to be very, very loud in the room. Um, so you, 
I think one of the attempts behind the human rights idea, one of, one of many, is to get away from this technocratic form of governance, but I think you're just looping back to it in a, uh, you know, without, being, without being terribly aware of it. Uh, some of the phenomena that I'm witnessing these days make me even more worried, um, namely the idea of a new natural law, where uh, human law is dictated by, by the environment. Um, now, some of this makes sense to me. So, for example, I very much like the, the work that's been done around planetary boundaries. I understand perfectly well that this is a gross oversimplification about what's actually happening, but we need gross oversimplifications because we're translating knowledge from, uh, from science to, to politics to law, and the, the information simply doesn't, doesn't make it across those borders in the same form. Um, so the planetary boundaries idea is very attractive to me because I think it makes the, um, the environment uh, pre present in political and economic and legal discussions in a way that it, it otherwise can't necessarily be. But some of the implications of that uh, make me very, very worried indeed. That um, law is somehow not a, not a human institution, that law can reckon directly with the environment, that, um, that uh, environmental degradation can simply be um, uh, transformed into legal norms without going through these complex processes of translation. Um, so I, I fear that all we're doing is just moving shells around. So we're worried about scientific input, we're worried about the lack of uh, democratic input, we're worried about the fact that um, the environment in and of itself isn't being taken seriously. And it seems that the solutions that are generated far too often just recreate the same problems in slightly different forms. Um, Think about uh, democracy, what I mean by democracy, I have already explained that I'm soft peddling a lot of my arguments for strategic and tactical reasons. I need to work them out slowly and, and carefully and I need to uh, hear how they land. I need to see um, a lot of reactions to them so that I can figure out how to, how to move further in the, in the discourse. But let me um, expand a little bit on, on of what I said at the very, very end about network logic, I've begun looking into private law. Um, begun, like, seriously, two weeks ago I've begun this exploration. I received a grant uh, a little while ago to, to look at, um, at private law approaches to, to risk generally, and to environmental risk more in particular. And I'm very attracted to the idea of decisions about um, uh, how to articulate interest and um, when to take questions of um, uh, disruptions of interest to adjudicatory bodies uh, can be made at a very local level. Um, so the, the logic of public law is we can't trust um, plaintiffs one by one to perceive the impact to their interests uh, as a result of environmental degradation or to do the right thing about it. Uh, or to act, you know, to overshoot their own interest in a particular issue and to, to act in the interest of the broader general public. Well, I, we recently had a change in government in Canada, but previous to that, I spent a decade in the wilderness as a Canadian environmentalist. I mean, forget about it. I would often encounter students who would say, you know, don't, about this transnational governance thing, don't you think that democratically elected governments should be making these kinds of decisions? And I would say inside my head, no, no, please. Um, I, I really don't have much faith in, um, in the capacity of states to carry this ball on their own, none whatsoever. Most of the heavy lifting in, in many jurisdictions is being done by municipalities or by some really interesting non-governmental organizations that are working directly with firms to uh, to help them structure their decision making and to help them build uh, environmental or sustainable development um, units and processes and, and decision making structures into, into their organizations. Um, so is there a general interest in, in environmental protection, for example? Yes. I mean, it's absurd to think that there wouldn't be, but it's at such a high level and there is so much at stake and I should also say we are severely running out of time. Um, so I, I won't wait any longer for um, the general consensus to emerge at the level of the state that you know, this ought to be taken forward. Um, I'm much more interested in seeing how 
um, a lot of individual decisions that are not necessarily coordinated in a formal explicit way, but that um, are linked together in, uh, through network logic could, uh, could have an impact on these, um, might, might just be more effective. Now speaking from, from the point of view of an environmentalist, but speaking from the point of view of a legal scholar, um, much more, I have an intuition which, um, which is, for which I think I have some basis, that that is actually much more what law is good at doing anyway. So um, operating at a, at a more decentralized local level. With respect to law and science, what I am looking for, um, what, I, what I'm looking for are um, what Gunther Tovner would describe as productive misunderstandings. Um, uh, standards that he developed within the scientific community about what counts as a good methodological decision or what counts as good laboratory practice. So productive misunderstandings of those standards as uh, something like policies, such that um, a government that or a governmental agency or a political authority of any kind that is trying to figure out what counts as good scientific knowledge, uh, good scientific insight into a particular phenomenon can um, can can look at the kinds of standards that, uh, that laboratories use, for example, to make decisions about their own methodologies, and can productively misunderstand those as uh, essentially quality control standards. And I say misunderstand because from the point of view of the scientific community, this isn't quality control as such. These aren't necessarily, these aren't policies in the way that a government official would understand them. Um, so um, when, when a lab assistant talks about the, the policies that are being implemented in a particular lab, it could sound to a governmental official like uh, a public policy. So they're kind of talking past one another, but in a way that, uh, that can create some kind of, some kind of resonance. Um, so, I mean, I guess I want to get away from um, the model that is very much under fire these days, but is still still really robust and still um, attracting a good deal of support. The model um, which, uh, which Bruno Latour describes as the old constitution, where you have science over here and you have politics over here, and there's just this one little conduit that leads from science to politics. It's a one-way conduit. And the job of science is to produce facts. The job of the IPCC, from a certain point of view, is precisely that, to produce facts. I mean, they're very explicit about it. And those facts are supposed to make all governments of the world realize that uh, the time to act is now and this is the direction in which we need to act. Um, and I think, as I've already said, that that approach makes science, all science, climate science, but all science, extraordinarily vulnerable. As soon as you um, look a little bit behind, you know, a little bit over the boundary and see um, how scientists talk, you know, in those, in those emails from East Anglia, how scientists talk about what it is they're doing, uh, it feels like the, the scales have fallen from one's eyes and uh, one cannot have any confidence in these people anymore. Yeah, um, environmental law uh, takes refugee uh, in uh, scientific Conclusions. Mm, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And these uh, conclusions are continuously being contested mm -hmm. as per your uh, last uh, sentence of uh, this image from uh, the Standard University. Um, to what extent uh, do these uh, contestations uh, affect? Uh, scholarship uh, in this uh, field uh, instead of underpinning the scholarship by foundational doctrines. The scho scientific scholarship, you mean? No, I mean legal scholarship uh, in environmental uh, law. How is it affected by these uh, contestations uh, instead of and that you and that scholarship, our doctrinal uh, scholarship. Okay. 
Yeah. Um, going back to brief your uh, democracy, democratic legitimation. So, in the, concept, in the context of plural, this multifarious plural authorities, then, uh, methodologically, in terms of discovery, wouldn't it be better than to talk about democratic legitimacy in the sense that for every authority or institutional landscape that is created, there are different determinants of democratic legitimacy. Yeah. And so it's worth exploring each one of them. And maybe there are different also understanding of democracies for each type of uh, epistemic knowledge, place of epistemic knowledge production. Yeah. And one more? Should I just a, 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 So thanks for this like intellectual scaffolding that sort of like directs towards maybe some methodological implications as well. Uh, but uh, if we were taking it out of the generalizable frame or sort of thinking of it in just a very discrete, concrete sort of example of that network logic being created or in, you know, like where that, we can see that at play, mm -hmm. could you give us like something specific to see it at work somehow? Like an example of, of what you're thinking about? Yeah, I can give a few examples. Um, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll take these ones in order. Um, so the reliance on science by politics, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. The last thing that political authorities want to do is exercise political authority. So there is a constant gesturing off stage. The scientist told me, the economist told me, uh, the public, the general public is telling me, and I fear that very often all of these things which normally we would, we would hope would happen, reference to experts, I hope that happens, reference to um, uh, you know, perspective taking from the point of view of the general public, I certainly hope that happens. Um, but usually, uh, especially with respect to environment, these decisions are being made in a way uh, the, the political authorities are trying to efface themselves, I think. They're trying to convince us that these decisions are being made off stage and that they're simply reacting to, to events. To, they're reacting to um, conclusions that are being made elsewhere. Now this gets me directly to um, a concern that Niklas Luhmann has about um, um, about a, a a very serious trend in environmental law in particular. He makes a lot. He made a lot of reference to environmental law, even when he wasn't specifically talking about environmental law. Environmental examples come up again and again and again. Um, but not just with respect to environmental law. So um, this gets back a little bit to the, the notion that I, that I put on the table a, a little bit ago about um, moving to a planning model of governance, where you, you figure out what the material goal is and you reverse engineer to get there. Uh, Luhmann frames this in terms of a conditional program which he views as the proper structure for law. I certainly doubt he would put it that way as opposed to um, um, initial programming and a goal-oriented programming. So goal-oriented programming is more along the lines of, uh, of a planning approach. Um, and there is an enormous amount to be said about the distinctions between those two, but I'll just focus on one which has really struck me a good deal, and that is that um, we are very often um, in a situation where a legal conclusion no longer depends on legal reasoning in any way, shape, or form. That um, the, the question whether a particular act was legal or not will be pushed out of the legal system into, for example, the scientific system. And this is going to happen, for example, when the law says um, it can happen in a variety of ways, but it, it, could, it could very well hample, it happen when a kind of a blanket clause approach to law is taken, where the, um, the kinds of activities that are going to be counted as legal are not inscribed in the rule. Instead, the rule is just a statement about the overall objective that is to be accomplished. Um, and I would cite, for example, sustainable development as a, as a, as a case in point. In such a case, the question whether an act is legal or not is going to depend on what external experts, that is experts external to the legal system, say about, um, about whether the impacts of that activity lead to environmental degradation or not. Um, and you see this in environmental scholarship um, 
environmental legal scholarship, especially of the public variety, which is one of the reasons why I've, I've flipped into uh, looking at private law. Um, so uh, judges do it, political authorities do it, and increasingly environmental scholars do it as well. They essentially outsource the, the conclusions about what would make a good policy or a good law or a good conclusion to uh, other, other forms of experts. Now, in private law, this is an area that I've only begun to explore, but one of the reasons I did so is because I was talking to a lot of my colleagues who are um, much more well-versed in the area, and I, I said to them that I had the impression that um, when private law encountered crises after um, industrialization and in the rise of um, mass consumer products, there was still an understanding that these, these issues fell to law to decide that uh, yes, you were going to listen to, the, um, to various actuarial experts or um, various scientific or economic experts when making determinations about uh, the impacts of uh, industrial processes on people who live in the neighborhood and, and that sort of thing. But these decisions were understood to be legal decisions. They had to do with rules of evidence. They had to do with standards and burdens of proof. Um, they had to do with thinking about legal institutions and legal rules in ways that could be adapted to the uh, to these dramatically and rapidly changing circumstances. And I don't see that kind of attempt to figure out these problems through the use of legal logic so much anymore. Um, in private law, still a little bit, so that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in, in pursuing uh, some scholarship in that area. Though I guess the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, though. So plural legitimacies, um, yes, absolutely. So I haven't really figured out um, how it is I'm going to talk about the sort of endpoints, well, not exactly endpoints, but the sorts of, um, I guess, experiments that I would like to see take place. Um, it's very difficult in this area because there's a kind of a monopoly on uh, deliberative democracy. It's basically the, the that, that um, that strand of scholarship has pretty much captured the field, and it's, it's rather difficult to, to work in um, oppositions to it, or alternatives to it for that matter. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be an opposition. But yes, the idea of um, plural legitimacy strikes me as, as very valid, in particular because, um, I mean, it, it, it came home to me very dramatically, for example, when Canada pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. This is not my government. And I mean, I know perfectly well that people around the world are reaching those kinds of conclusions. So yes, I think that approach would make a good deal of sense. Um, it's one of the reasons, I suppose, why um, the democratic bona fides of these political authorities, self-constituted political authorities, doesn't worry me so much. What worries me a lot more is the terribly impoverished quality of their legal standards. I, they don't claim that their norms are law. I make that claim because I think it's analytically useful and because I think it holds their feet to a, the fire in a way that um, critiques from deliberative democracy don't necessarily do so. Um, an example of network logic, um, I guess the, the Ur example would probably be um, carbon credits. Um, and that, uh, or um, red plus plus, whatever it's called now. Um, so, the interesting thing about these that I've been toying around with is that um, it seems to me that the translation of environmental risk into the language of political risk doesn't work very well. I don't know what it would take to make politicians understand that um, not taking environmental positions would put them at risk, for example, of not being elected or being regarded as illegitimate. But I don't see that happening anytime soon. What I do see happening is um, a very ready, surprisingly ready, maybe it's not so surprising, a capacity for economic actors to translate environmental risk into economic risk. Or for actors that are circling around these economic actors to do so on their behalf. So the whole logic, an important part of the logic behind certification organizations or certification programs, for example, is the promise of access to increasingly lucrative markets for sustainable products countered by the threat of lack of access to those markets. And what can certainly quibble with the way in which um, these authorities are exercising their authority, all kinds of problems with some of the processes and products and, uh, and so on that have been, that have been approved, and some of the authorities, the 
uh, economic actors who have received certification. Certainly these things are all open to criticism. But I see contact there. I see contact between notions of environmental risk and notions of economic risk that I don't see replicated uh, in terms of risk of um, legal liability or uh, risk of being voted out of office. So quite frankly, I'm happy to explore um, economic incentive structures, as dangerous as that is for an environmental scholar to do. Would you like to continue the conversation over wine? We have about half hour and then over to the center. Great. Thank you again, Jay. Yes, sir.